This is Off Planet Radio. Hey everybody, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Offplanetradio.com is the website. Uh, the YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash Off Planet. Is it Off Planet Media or Off, off Planet, Planet Radio? Media. Off Planet, off Planet Media. Media. Okay, no, good. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't forget that. <laughs> and uh, of course, the membership site for those of you who want to support and engage with us is patreon.com forward slash Off Planet Media. I'm Randy Moggins. I'm here with my co-host, Emily Moyer. And uh, tonight, we travel the paths of the interwebs to one of the more friendly hostels along the way. And Emily's going to tell you about our destination. All right. <laughs> All right, guys. Glad to be back. I uh, hope everyone's doing well. Um, so tonight's guest is the master of intros, and I try to make ours fun and interesting, but I've got nothing on him. So consider this my comic tribute to him. So here we go. <laughs> Our guest survived the boredom and angst of a small town Midwestern upbringing and the indoctrination program known as Catholic School. With his punk rock attitude intact, he headed west with big dreams of a closet pot growing operation, making him a marijuana mogul. While his parents were likely relieved when that dream faded, we should all be delighted that despite his next step, the system failed at stopping his game at mid-level mall mediocrity and instead forced him to level up. From its humble beginnings, his podcast has evolved into one of the most interesting, polished, and well-respected shows in the conspiracy and alternative information realms. He's here to tell us about his journey into the alternative media, how he navigates the current terrain of the conspiratorium, preach the gospel of earth-shaped agnosticism, and go deep on the topic of inner realms. Straight from the higher side, just south of me in sunny San Diego, drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke. Greg Carl with my man. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Hey, all right. Thanks for having me. See, it's just that easy. I don't do anything special. That was actually pretty good. <laughs> that was pretty, yeah, it was pretty, I spent like, like I, I spent all day not paying attention at work thinking how I was going to put that together. So. <laughs> Well, it worked out. Great job. <laughs> All righty. Thanks, Dan. It's really nice to have you here. Um, I, you know, like I was telling you before we started, I feel like you are one of the most under-interviewed people who at this point has probably one of the greatest depths of knowledge and most interesting perspectives of people in our uh, line of work out there. And so uh, we're really happy to have you. And uh, let's get into it, man. Tell us how you ended up on the higher side, how, how, how you went from Arnold, Missouri to the higher side. Well, you know, you said mid-level mall mediocrity, and that pretty much nails my 20s right there. But, you know, I was always kind of a rebellious kid. And, you know, I, I went to a private school that was pretty constricting. So I rebelled against that. And the first day of senior year, they finally kicked me out and said, you can't come back. And I had actual consequences for, you know, pissing them off so many, many times. You know, I didn't get to graduate high school with the friends I've had since kindergarten. So, I mean, that was a weird thing. Then I went to public school where the big difference in, in private school is at least your parents care enough to spend two grand a year, two grand a semester, whatever it is. Then you go to public school if you've never been there. And in Arnold, Missouri, you got people who don't care much at all. They're just glad that somebody's watching their kids. It's kind of like a babysitter, even at those higher levels. And then it gets, I don't know, there were some awkward moments. There was a rude awakening of just, you know, kind of the bubble that I was put in. I think that's a smart thing to do, you know, thing to think about and not do to your own kids. But, you know, I didn't, I went to college for a little bit. It didn't go all that well. And so I got hooked up with a job managing Great American Cookies, a kiosk in the mall decorating cookie cakes. And, you know, when I was 21, I was like, holy shit, somebody's going to put me in charge of their business? Like, this is kind of cool. Then at 27 and 28, it starts to feel pretty sad. And, you know, GameStop was uh, kind of the last bit of that mid-level mall mediocrity, but I always wanted to do something else. And so I started doing the podcast and it started out as kind of a thing with local comics where I didn't feel like much of importance was happening. So I kind of shifted gears to my second love of conspiracy, interviewed um, Michael Tassarian was the first one. 
And I was just like, yeah, this is what I want to do. And I always call the show a bolder coast to coast AM hosted by a more mellow Alex Jones. Cause those were the two extremes, right? I mean, coast to coast is pretty vanilla and also has a Christian flavor ever since Art Bell, you know, stopped hosting it. Yeah. And then you got Alex Jones on the right. who's just crazy screaming with a vein popping out of his neck about how he's got the documents. I'm like, yeah, I'm not that guy either. So I really felt like there was a, a place to do another type of conspiracy show. And I guess that's why it's worked out. You know, I did it early. So that helps too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I remember I kind of, I guess I didn't catch on to you until a few years into it. And then at some point I went back and listened to some of your older shows. And it is very interesting how much you've evolved from the beginning um, till, till now, you know what I mean? But always sort of with a thread that has tied, tied through there. I like the way, I mean, you're different than a lot of us. Like you, I think, I do think you have a lot of your own perspective, but you're much more uh, neutral in your stance when you interview a lot, you know what I mean? And, right. and you, um, I appreciate that you, I can tell whether you, I, I don't know if you've ever even said so or not on the show, but I can tell you read every book that you <laughs> interview somebody about, about. And that's, I mean, I, I totally appreciate that. You know, we'd like to have way more, uh, we don't have too many authors these days on the show because we don't want to have them on without having read them. And we just, neither of us have that much time to read because we're both still working full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. And so I really only will have them on if I've been able to read their books. Um, and I definitely appreciate that it's very obvious because, you know, you quote things from like, you know, individual pages and whatever that you're doing the reading and that you've really actually taken in all of this knowledge that you've been talking about all this time and not just sort of glossed over it or, you know, hit on little things to have people on the you know, show for, for hits and whatever. Um, you really do a, an amazingly in-depth job. And, well, um, you know, and, and let me just say this. I get the sense from listening to the show. Uh, that you're passionate about the people you have on and the subjects you discuss. And that really shows in the energy that comes across and the level of intensity the discussions take on. Um, and that's something, again, you know, we don't see a whole lot of in, in, in this media because everything is so rapidly fired now onto, onto YouTube. It's almost like our biggest problem is that we're running maybe two to three. Well, we used to run 10 days. Now we're running almost two weeks on production hmm. that's too slow by modern standards we should have shoved that thing out the door immediately after the record button went off or or live streamed it see that that's the other thing right now is pressure to do live streaming but we don't like it <laughs> doing doing it the way you do it and i i you know i have to say i've heard you discuss your editing process and i, I power to you brother I used to do that years ago, and it, it, I started to lose my joy over it, but I appreciate the intensity that you put into even just doing the post-production on, on the shows. <laughs> Man, this is just such a great ad for THC. I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it definitely is the least inspiring part of the job doing the edit, but it is important, and I guess I felt like if this was my only shot to get out of a retail hell that I hated so much. It was like, well, what are the components? What can I do to make it right? You know, I wanted to talk to people for extended periods of time with no breaks, without uh, hosts who are constantly pontificating or trying to fold in a guest research into their worldview instead of just letting them give their perspective. I mean, I wanted it to be a deep dive into alternative minds and I wanted to take as much of a backseat as I could. And the editing, of course, you know, I take out all those ums and ahs because people don't generally talk quite as fluidly as they might think they do. And over the course of two hours, you get these little ticks that can sometimes be distracting. So if you extract those out, focus on the material, I think, you know, I did everything I could to wrap the package of conspiracy interviews in the best paper I could find. Not that I can do it best in the world, but as good as I could do it. Because, you know, if you're going to work for someone 50 hours a week, you know, you better be able to work for yourself with that kind of energy. And so I just... Yeah, yeah. That's, that's an entrepreneur's attitude right there. Which, by the way, again, another commendation, you do kind of run it in an entrepreneurial fashion, which is kind of refreshing as well, because there's a level of professionalism to it that we, we don't get a lot of. I mean, it seems like the, the strata right now runs from like the guy that just decided yesterday to pick up a mic and do a friggin' podcast. And then, you know, at the high end of it, obviously you have the well-produced stuff 
like Coast to Coast and Alex Jones and, you know, the, the network platform level. But there is a place in all of this and, and, and we have it too. I mean, we're not just shoving it out the door as is. There's production standards that we do as well. I mean, I'm very insistent on certain things, looking a certain way, sounding a certain way, and, you know, communicating certain essential topics on, on, on a certain level. Mm -hmm. But it's refreshing to see somebody that loves their craft enough to, to go through that. I, I you know, I, I was just sitting here flashing back to the days when I used to uh, do exactly what you're doing. And I, I was using a, a Adobe Audition in those days to edit, and I spent months trying to figure out what was the algorithm that would let me automatically scan a file on Adobe Audition and take out um, my own ums and ahs. And I actually, at one point, had one. Wow. And wow. then the friggin' program, and then the friggin' program, which was version 2.0, got dumped when I went to some version of Windows that ate it. And all that was gone again. So, bummer. <laughs> you know, another thing that kind of bothers me about the alternative realm, and I'm sure I would have been guilty of it had I never become a host. And that's just the skepticism, the, the catch 22 of trying to put quality into your product. Because once you, you know, you do, you're doing this because you want to do it, you try to make it as good as you can. Yep. You attract an audience because it's well produced and put together well, at least to a decent amount of people's yep. liking. And then when you amass that audience, you have a high quality show. People say, well, this is too good for some stoner mm. dude in Southern California. I wonder who his backers are. I'm like, what do you need backers for? You make a website, you buy a microphone. It really isn't that difficult. But people are skeptical of even, they say, the music on the show. You know, I hire. Oh, we get this all the time. Yeah, just production value in general. Like, how do you have those resources? It's the internet. You can freelance hire people. Do you realize that? It isn't that difficult. But it's well, that. Let's, let's talk minutes. about that for a minute because you actually feature a rather unique type of sound in terms of the musicians that you hire for those those songs that you use both on the front end and back end of your show. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit because those are vocalists that are doing um, custom mixes for you, I assume. Yeah, the, well, the way it started was just, I used to end the show with a song that I thought encapsulated the, the topic and the episode, and I started getting the dings on YouTube, of course. And the YouTube is such a small portion of the audience. I don't know why I let it control so much of my time, just because of they, those, those dings. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to get artists to do the songs that I like, and then I'll just rotate. I'll have a song for, mo for every topic. You know, there's maybe 10 slices of the conspiracy pie. I'll have everything covered. And uh, I also, you know, my, my real love was, was comedy. That's how the show started. You know, that's what I got away from. But I also like parody music and just creative stuff. So instead of straight cover songs, I would hire artists to do almost like Weird Al conspiratorial yeah. parody yeah. of changing the lyrics to mainstream songs. And I just started doing it more and more. People really like it. So I've continued and I, I now have a good working relationship with a few really good artists that I just got lucky with and they appreciate, you know, being on the platform and doing something unique and I definitely appreciate their talent. So it's really worked out. But of all the reasons to think I could be somehow connected to Freemasons or the CIA because I have a <laughs> singer on my podcast, I mean, with that level of paranoia, you know, it's not really helping anything. I mean, that can't be your level of discernment. I mean, yeah, find any connection to anything but retail management in my background and weed. Well, if you, if, 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 <laughs> I have to say, I would have to question anyone's discernment if you're actually a person I've never had any suspicions of. You know what I mean? And, and, and you know, I've been around the block a few times. I can find paranoia anywhere, and it, I, so if someone is looking for it if they're if they're find, trying to find it with you. You know, they're 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 sort of well, desperate for something to find. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, you don't. Um, Largely, these are the triggers that come up on YouTube because of the, the, the movable feast that it is. And they're, they're the people that actually bitch and complain and make comments that aren't constructive on YouTube are generally the people that haven't watched the video at all, or they've watched like five minutes of it, or they've queued in the beginning or the end, or they focus in on some weird, you know, glitch. If I move my finger too close to my nose, I must be giving a, a secret sign. And I bake frequencies into the music that we use. 
and there's reverse speech. And it, it's just hideous the number of conspiracies baked into people who are actually deconstructing conspiracies in the first place. I mean, it's incredible yeah. that, that we're this complicit in the very order it looked like we were trying to take down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, I was gonna, uh, the other thing, two, two things, because I was gonna leave, let's start with this one. You, the music has evolved on your show, but there's also been an evolution in the artwork. Um, you know, you used to kind of have your conspiracies on there and sort of like a collage of stuff. And it's kind of over the last year and a half or two, you kind of have gone to like a more sort of polished kind of art, which I actually really like. Is that, do you have a, an artist or is that something you're doing? I. Uh I don't have an artist. I've just gotten better at kind of crafting those things. You know, when you start something, a lot of people have a tendency, well, a lot of people in their head probably have a dream job they'd like to do and they just don't do it. They just keep kind of thinking of it like, oh, if I had a bar, I know exactly what I'd do. But you never get those first steps of like getting a bar. You only know what you'd do if you had a successful business. And I mean, I was guilty of the same thing. For years, I wanted to do something like this and I just kept not doing it because I couldn't get it perfect in my head conceptually. And you just got to not do that. Do your dream, move towards the goal, and you want to find progress, not perfection. And artwork, I am terrible at, and I'm not that good at even graphic design. And so I've gotten lucky over the years where certain listeners have been like, hey, buddy, I am a graphic design guy. Here's a couple of pieces. And I use those pieces over and over again. And then like for the weekly show, I've gotten better at kind of putting something together that looks attractive because, you know, I've read some stuff about how to do that, but it's just about in terms of anything um, someone else can take away. It's like move towards your goal and you'll, you'll yeah. get better at the stuff that you're not that great at over time, you know, look at it, step back and be like, what can I shore up? And the artwork definitely needed to be shored up, but you, you worry about the fundamentals first and sort the rest out later. But I think at this point I can relax. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, you know, I, this for me, I'm only a year and a half or two years into this and just like the, you know, I agree with what you say totally. Like I was terrified in the beginning, but just every time you get better at it and things that were once weaknesses become strengths and sometimes people just come to appreciate your weaknesses. And so it feels like a strength, and, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to sort of leave to the end, but since you brought it up, I just want to hit on it. You said that your original love was comedy, and that's something that's kind of come up again a little bit recently for you. I know you were doing those uh, tinfoil hat um, live podcasts. Is that still happening? Um, you were doing those up here in Pasadena, weren't you? What's going on with that? Yeah. Uh, well, I got lucky in that an LA comic who's great, his name's Sam Tripoli, he started doing a podcast called Tinfoil Hat, where he basically does something really interesting that he brings in, I would say mainly comedians, but you know, he casts a wide net too, but mainly comedians to talk about a conspiratorial subject. And that is great. That's kind of like what I was going for in the beginning. The only problem is that the comics I was hanging out with really weren't conspiracy people. They kind of shitted on all those ideas. So it kind of made for an awkward, you know, first couple of shows, but he does a great job with this. And that's kind of how you know, we met is because his co-host Ryan told him about THC. He really liked it. He's gotten a few uh, guests for follow-up interviews from THC. And uh, he's had me on twice. And then we went from that, you know, camaraderie on the air to doing live shows. And we've done two. And um, one was at the Ice House in Pasadena, the oldest comedy club in the country. And the other was yeah. at the uh, legendor legendary, legendary Comedy Store in La Jolla. And so, I mean, that was a real treat for me. And I think yeah. that's why people should pursue whatever is important to them because I've just, I don't know what the hell I was going to do. I was really going to work at GameStop forever. Like maybe <laughs> move up to regional because you have no resume. You know, a lot of people get stuck in these areas they don't want to be in because it's what they've done previously. And that's all the resume shows. And you're not allowed to really do new things unless you create it yourself. And I, I really would urge anyone to go that path because now instead of decorating cookie cakes and taking shitty trade-ins for cash, you know, I'm getting interviewed by Chris Jericho <laughs> doing live shows with Sam Tripoli. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I work on the nights. I was working on the nights that you had those, the one up here in Los Angeles because I was going to, I would like to have hit that up. But if you have another one at some point, I'll definitely have to come check it out. Um, but I think some, some, there's some clips and some recordings from some of those on, on YouTube that people can check out. Because the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the banter with Eddie Bravo was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Bravo, his, I mean, he's one of the yeah. 
jiu-jitsu greats and you know he's a he's an alpha male so when he yeah. wants to talk about the flat earth and some geologist in the audience thinks that's bullshit well <laughs> that's gonna take 40 minutes to sort out <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right so let's um you know i I kind of am really interested in your perspective. I mean, you've been doing this for a really long time right now. And mm -hmm. I think your first show was Tassarian. And I think the last show you put out a couple of days ago was you know, about vaccines. So you've talked to almost everyone at this point and, and you've covered such a wide variety of topics. Like what, where, like where to you is the, I mean, I think I was doing some research on you before we did this and mm -hmm. I was actually a little surprised Part of me was surprised, but part, uh, part of me wasn't surprised to A, find out that you and I had more things in common than I might have originally thought. Mm -hmm. And that and one of them being that sometimes the health, the health shows are the ones that you feel are the most um, important and the most rewarding, which has also been surprising to me. Like I kind of, you know, feel sort of the same. Um, but where do you think the big weight, like the, the, the sort of important focus, the energy should be right now? What, what's sort of speaking to you? Well, you are right about the health shows because I think our culture is just so full of poisons from every angle that it is really important to try to shore up your own health. I mean, everybody can improve in that regard. Um, I did a show with Dr. Richard Jacoby about sugar and the impact that it has on us. And man, yeah. that was one that a lot of people really liked. And I definitely learned some things. He talks about sugar's effects on our nerves, for example. And just uh, one little anecdote that still sticks with me is everybody's heard of carpal tunnel. And they think it's because all these secretaries were sitting at the desk with their arms in the posture of the keyboard. And he said, I think that the problems with people's wrists and joints has more to do with the Diet Coke that was sitting on the table than it does the keyboard. Mm. And I just was like, man, you know, no one really thinks about this stuff. But now we are so full of poisons, it's hard to decide what's hurting us. Is it vaccines? Is it sugar? Is it GMOs? You know, is it 5G? Is it technologically based? There's just so much shit out there. You know, is it raining from the sky? We don't even know. How are you going to separate poisons out in today's world? We're just... I well, think we're being terraformed. That's the right. pure yeah. answer is that the human is actually the, the subject of the terraforming. Mm -hmm. which means all the chemical combinations and things that have been pushed at us with the advent of uh, the commercial food industry after World War II. And you look at the escalation of these products that when when you examine them at any level, you discover there isn't a hell of a lot in this stuff that's actually nutritional value. It's salt and sugar and fat and- And sometimes- uh, a, a load of preservatives. And sometimes it's just imitations of salt and sugar and fat. That's actually even worse than salt and sugar and fat. That, that's interesting, Greg. Um, I, actually, I would agree with you that sugar like, is the big- if, one, if a person's gonna make one change to their life from any of this, I'd say like the sugar is something to really look at. I agree with you. I, in fact, uh, I co-host here, uh, you know, sort of mind control conspiracy kind of podcast. But the first thing I did sort of on my own away from this show was a series on the idea of sugar as programmable matter. Uh, I think sugar is like, uh, it's actually where a lot of those things you just mentioned come together. I think a lot of the, um, 5G and a lot of the stuff that's about dealing with like the, the, the frequency waves and chemtrails and the GMO and all that other stuff, actually the, it all comes together at the point of the amount of sugar that's in your body. That's sort of wow. what makes all of those systems go. Um, and so, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I can't remember if I heard your show about sugar. I'm going to have to go back and take a listen to it. But um, yeah, I think sugar is one of those topics that I could just go on and on and on forever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you seem to know more than me, but the fact that it's crystalline, I mean, that makes sense that it would kind of be it's, an antenna for stuff like that. It's crystalline, it's cubic, it can hold information, and it's, you know, basically like it's the main um, programmer of the gut, the, the brain that's in our gut. You know, we have a brain in our stomach and one in our head, and I w am pretty willing to say at this point that the mind control that is in our head is equally as much controlled by the, the, the control of the brain that's in our gut. And when I stopped eating sugar, all of my programming broke down, <laughs> all of it. You know what I mean? Like I, I live in a completely different world now than I did when I ate sugar, you know? Good on you, because man, yeah. I still have a hard time with the addiction, I'll tell you. Yeah, it's, it, it, I think it's tougher than any, any of the rest of them, and that's sort of um, by design. Mm -hmm. 
we have some interesting, I, I've done a series on that. We have an interesting show coming out in the next couple of days with Cliff High that we've been doing a series with him on time, but he brought sugar into the mix too. And so that was kind of an interesting place. We got to go in that conversation. So we're looking forward to people getting to hear that. But yeah, for sugar, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I also wanted to ask you like, what is, is there something, because you interviewed so many people and been through so many topics at this point, is there something that sort of in your early years of doing it, you thought you knew everything about or you, you were sure that it was true and now you think it's total bullshit and vice versa, something you thought for sure was nonsense and now you think may be true? Hmm. Well, I think that in my younger days, I had a tendency to spout off about conspiratorial positions because I thought they were provocative and interesting and probably true. And then I think later, you learn that, no, that shit really is true. You know, the media really is controlled by only a couple of companies. There really is a revolving door between vaccine manufacturers and the CDC. Like, it is all connected. And you just start verifying that stuff. And then sometimes you step back from a certain position. I, I do this sometimes in the, in the wrap-ups. And it's like, look what we just established. Like, that's crazy. The fact that, you know, it's at this level or whatever. And I think that's kind of the thing. You know, 9-11, of course, was a catalyst for a lot of people. It's cliche to say that, but I'm only 32 years old. Like, it really was the catalyst where this stuff got real. And it wasn't all just vague conspiracy, cabal, oily appendages of the planet's puppet masters kind of stuff. And I was like, wow, this is happening right now. And then from there, a lot of people couldn't accept that. And, you know, you hear, start hearing the term false flag. And then you look at the history and you're like, oh my God, 9-11 isn't really that exceptional. If you look at the timeline, they do yeah. false flags fairly often. A lot of military conflicts are started by false flags. Yeah, Spanish-American <laughs> War, uh, that, Pearl that's Harbor. Right. I mean, you can go the whole way back in history and oh, realize yeah. that this whole thing's a fucking setup. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe taking it a little more seriously and just growing up and being like, you know, I think some people might be afraid to look too deep into the data because they don't want to have their conspiratorial opinions, you know, ex like kind of uh, debunked. But now I think like, no, I feel pretty bulletproof on a lot of topics. Yeah. That's, that's better. It's better to be that way. You don't want to hide away from data. Of course, we know there's manipulation in mainstream data, but you need to be able to have something more than just soapboxing because you think it sounds good. And so I think as I've matured, that's something that I think is kind of changed and been important. Um, and I also think the value of magic, which is another topic that a lot of people don't like and they think it might be all negative, but I don't, I don't really think that way. I think if it's part of our reality, then it's just a neutral part of our reality and it's just the way it is and you can use it as a tool for good or bad, you know? And I like to examine how the elite use it. I like to see the clues that indicate they see value in it. So I know that it's like a, a real thing, at least from their perspective. But then I, I really have enjoyed doing shows with people who practice magic themselves that go through teaching people how to use it in their own life because that's just super interesting. And I have realized that it's actually very, very hard to do real ritual the way it's written in the grimoires. Like people just don't do it in our culture. And so it's real easy to say magic doesn't work, but it's like, when have you to the T, follow the Higromantia, because you haven't, if you haven't like gone and, uh, you know, crafted a deer antler knife and then consecrated it this way or that way, like all the things you have to do, it's very difficult. And um, I think that was kind of interesting to learn for me. It's kind of like a science like chemistry. It's like, I, I'm not a chemist either. And I don't go mixing things around that I don't know what I'm doing with. Cause yeah, that's dangerous as is magic. If you don't know what you're doing. But I do think of it as like a deep study that is, is way more complex and valid than I would have thought five years ago. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that it's something that in our ancient past used to be much more common and its removal from our lives has been part of our devolution. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I, you know, so I think part of the reason that there's so much taboo or why, especially a lot of people who are in the conspiracy realm who are, you know, 
more conventional or Christian or whatever, they, you know, look down on it. It, 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 The reason it's suppressed and the reason it is taboo is not because it's bad. It's because it, 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 it's part of how a human is powerful. You know what I mean? It's part of how a human finds their own power as opposed to finding power from something outside of themselves. Well, it's the way humans yeah. rediscover the innate power that they have. And in a sense, you know, looking at magic as it's practiced through ritual and grimoire and all the, you know, uh, ancient lore knowledge, that was even a distant echo of what occurred in distant ages when we actually walked in that as part of our natural beingness. It's, mm-hmm. It's controversial, you can argue about it, but from my perspective, I've seen enough of it to realize that there's there's ways you can do this, but it's all a belief system and it's all a belief structure. And the way you build a belief structure is you invest power into things either internally or externally in order to deploy the internal power that's within you. So all of it is useful and it points towards a direction that we need to get back to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When people say to me that magic is negative or bad, it's like, well, who told you that? Religious authorities that are <laughs> negative and bad. What have they done for you? Stolen your money and built gold palaces and the Pope wears Prada slippers? Like, what does that do for you? Why are you going to listen to them? So I, it's like, consider the source. It's like, they took this away from people. If you look at megalithic structures, clearly, yep. Yep. this was deeply part of their culture. Yep. They removed it. And that, that was a, there was a reason for that. They wanted to take that power away, say, hey, I'm, I'm your, your liaison of the spirit world. Don't worry about it. I got it. Just give me some money. Confess your sins. You know, let me. Well, they built the churches right on the ley lines, so, you know, the energy grid. Mm-hmm. They overlaid everything. They took ancient pagan sites and, yes. they, and, and they, you know, after their bloody crusades, then they'd sanctify it to whatever deity they were putting a steeple onto. But it was, it was basically designed to bury, again, this innate power. The, the, the best magic originates from man's relationship to the elements. It's elemental. Yes, and, I and, agree. And, and that's, that's been hidden. It's been made fun of. You know, well, it, it's, it's I, also it's mocked. Like- yeah. It's also always the church and the government that is saying these things are taboo or negative or bad and shouldn't be done. But everything that they do is based on magical thinking. So it's not good for you, right? Like, you know, everything, I mean, if they're saying magic is not something real, then clearly whatever they're doing is just made up and based on magical thinking. Sure. And, and, and yeah. that's why, you know, uh, Vice President Henry Wallace decided to put the, the, the occult symbols on the back of the dollar. Well, he was, in a, he was a 33 degree Mason. You know, when they decided to put those occult signals, uh, occult symbols on the, on the currency, that was a very deliberate act of magic on the American people. Yeah. They were basically, with a wink and a nod, telling you from here on out, there's no value in your money. It's going to be your belief structure and in God we trust. Damn. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm with you. I agree. Yeah. Magic so, is right there. I mean, the, the dollar bill, you use it every day. I mean, we don't see them all that often anymore. It's just numbers on the screen now. But when you do get a hold of one, I mean, there, it's covered in sigils. How do you not think this is interesting or weird? Or how do you not kind of tug on that thread? It's kind of weird that people don't, but they're under the spell. It's covered in sigils. And it also, it also if you look at some people who've done interesting work on what's on our currency, is it predicts the future. It memorializes events from the past that they say didn't happen the way, we, you know, whatever that they say happened, they didn't happen that way. If you look, uh, that's that guy. He's kind of a Christian guy, but he's pretty incredible the way he looks at the money. I don't know if you've ever seen his work. Jonathan Kleck, he folds all of the currency in different ways. And you can see 9-11, Oklahoma City, all these different things on. Have you seen it? I've seen, not him, but I have seen that done. Yeah, you yeah. can see not, not only the Twin Towers with billowing smoke coming out, but also the Pentagon. You yep. can pull it another way and see a gray alien, which I think is pretty Ooh, interesting. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, it's, it's weird. I mean, the, the one, the five, and the 20, I think probably the 10 as well. But that's, you fold up those bills and you see all those different things. And, yeah. oh, actually, you know, what's interesting is one of those things you can see is the Hoover Dam. I was just going to say that, yeah. Explosion in it, and it's like, 
just watch. Just watch for the rest of our lives. Yeah. If, the, if the Hoover Dam, which also has a lot of other strange things built into it, apparently yeah. has some, uh, some engravings of constellations and stuff, yep. like plaques. But watch for that. If the Hoover Dam, it's also been in movies that the Hoover Dam's attacked. So it's just yep. another reason to pay attention. Watch out for an attack there because I think that is part of the script. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That, that's that he started looking at that one and saying this. Jonathan Kleck guy, you know, showed us how there's. If you turn it one way, there's the Hoover Dam as it is, and then if you even on another bill or if you turn it another way, you can see where like the barrier is broken, like it's blown up. Um, he had you know interesting stuff like that. People also talk about how um, on the dollar bill, like the Capitol building is under a dome, and that that's proof that we live inside of a bubble or a dome or something like that. So there is all of these interesting things aside from ju you know just the sigils and whatever on our currency that are either you know markers for the future or explanations about <laughs> the different uh, alternative explanations about things from the past. So yeah, it is super duper interesting. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah. So I, one of the things I really wanted to get into with you, because I've heard some things have come up a couple of times on shows in the past year, little bits when, you, you know, when you've been talking to other people, about some of your frustration um, with the current state of the alternative media and also just, you know, with sort of, in some ways, the makeup of the conspiratorial realm on the internet. Um, and we share some of those frustrations. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, because we talked off air, I know what you're referencing. And well, in recent years, it would be the Trump stuff. Like, I really do think that they cast out a series of nets of different shapes and sizes to scoop up people. And for the longest time, the conspiracy people were sort of outside of that net. We're looking at the Bush years. We're looking at the Obama years. You know, uh, we're looking at Hillary coming in again. You know, we are kind of, set in that regard but then alex jones starts going off on how trump is for us and he's our guy and everybody just is like yeah he is and it's like what are you talking about show me an example from his life where he has ever given really? it about <laughs> any give me one like Take it, brother i definitely i definitely couldn't go with Bernie Sanders because I don't think centralized control and dependency on that is the way to go. But I at least think he's a decent guy. At least, I mean, maybe it's all for show, but and maybe I'm being naive here. But at least he's got pictures of himself that are black and white in the '60s protesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Trump doesn't have that. He's never cared about anyone. So it, that really, really bothers me. Of course. Also, John G. Trump, his uncle, worked for MIT, was friendly with Hanover Bush, and he was the point man on analyzing Tesla's papers and then proclaiming there was nothing of value here. I think that is nuts. That's one of those facts that I almost don't believe. Like, I hear myself start to say, and I'm like, wait, go verify that again. Is that real? But it is real because I've yeah. watched actual interviews um, with John G. Trump, the school that he worked at the old black and white footage and they i think it's black and white it's definitely old footage and they're interviewing him just to get these old scientists thoughts they just want to make sure they have it all on record in, in this film archive and so they interview him for an hour and he's talking about how when he was working on his thesis he ran into some areas in the in, in electro not he didn't say electrogravitics but electrophysics like he's working in some strange areas and he runs into a problem and he goes directly to Hanover Bush to get advice on what to do on his thesis and Bush refers him to a guy he doesn't say the name of who's working on some exotic things in that area that might be helpful to John G Trump so this is a guy a degree away from the Bush family, working at MIT, and everybody talks about the Tesla conspiracy, that all his work is suppressed. Well, this would be the guy who did it, the uncle of the president. I also just interviewed Mark Devlin, who I think does some really great work in the music realm. But in his book, Musical Truth 2, he talks about lifetime actors and how all these people are connected and seem to be one big family or maybe a couple different families. But according to the book, he says, if you go back 18 generations, Trump 
Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton have the same great grandparents. Eighteen. <laughs> yep. So, uh, just, yep. so, so I, I haven't. I got, that's important. You can't just have you blind. Know, this is Family Feud. That's what this is. Right. Okay, so I, I have an advanced copy of the book. I haven't gotten there yet because we're he's going to be on again this week uh, with us this week, and I'm actually in his book a little bit because uh, I did some shows with him about uh, underground dance music scene. Ah. Yeah, And um, I haven't gotten to that part of the book, but that's interesting. But no, the Lifetime Actors thing is huge. And it is, there is, I mean, we do, there have been people talk, have talked about the relationship between the Trump family and Tesla family. And also it's not, I mean, uh, Trump and Clinton, Trump used to donate to the Clintons. He used to support the Clintons. They went to each other's weddings. You know what I mean? So it's not, this is all for show. I mean, the biggest thing that I can't believe, I mean, I've been super disturbed with the way people who I thought were firmly outside of the left-right paradigm. In fact, people who were show, at least showing signs of, if not committed to, some form of libertarianism or anarchism got pulled right back into completely being neocons wow. um, with this whole Trump thing. Um, it's, it's disturbing. Um, I can't see how conspiracy theorists wouldn't see that this is the Trump card in the New, in the, uh, right? in the New World Order playing card deck. I agree. I mean, he's it's so his stupid. Family, his family is such a model for like a Rockefeller Rothschild family. I was reading another um, expose on Trump and it talked about some things he had said about his own childhood and that his dad like would always try to deceive him and always withhold from him and like trick him and tell him like the world is cold and dark and everybody's trying to screw you over. And he does that in, to his own sons. That is exactly what they say what Ro Rothschild did. Well, that's trauma-based programming. It's, yeah. it's the light yeah. version. It's the family version, but it's still trauma-based programming. So it's like, you know, what has Trump done that isn't basically a model for an, for an oligarch family, or at least on the surface? I don't even think he has as much wealth as he says, but that's not even yeah. a big deal. He's playing the part of an oligarch. Yeah. Who has this family and government? And like, what do you? What about this? Do you like as an alternative thinker? It should be nothing, you yeah. know. Alex Jones says it's okay, so it's okay. Well, and and then there's people. I mean, Alex Jones, like some of this on a, on a lot of levels. This probably doesn't surprise you or I about Alex Jones, but there are some others in the alternative media who I've been really surprised at how um, they have really gotten sucked in by this and they really think that he's going to drain the swamp and that he's going to arrest all the pedophiles and and some of these same people have really like gotten into this q thing like it's gospel and i find mm -hmm. it, it disturbing like i find it um you know upsetting from a discernment level but also like what is it about these people who theoretically done as much research and been on this boat as long as you or I have, what is it about these people that still needs a savior, that still needs to imagine that there's going to be somebody come in on the white horse and clean things up and are so desperate for it that they don't even care who it is? I know. I don't get it, but the savior motif is something I always kind of hit on. I'm always thinking, like, from when, I, when a guest gives me a new perspective, I'm like, hold on, is there a savior in here? Is there some wishful mm -hmm. thinking? In here, and I don't want to be completely cynical and nihilistic and say there's no hope anywhere. There, there is, but you know, to think some dark horse just rides into the top of the pyramid and just cuts it down from within, I really think that's naive thinking. The best approach, I think, is really to try to make a living in a way that you're that you enjoy, that you're comfortable with, where you're not under anybody else, and then distance yourself from the machine of yeah. government as much as you can like that's really all i do i mean yeah. i love i love the show i do but in terms of the rest of the things you know as the show progresses i've considered possibilities like doing a habitat for humanity like once a month or once a year or quarter and just be like you know we're actually building houses for people for christ's sake or something like that i used to do a little um a raffle thing called the money bomb where I'd give half the donations I got back. Yeah, to I remember. Yeah. I mean, that was amazing. There'd be people who'd be like, dude, I finally got to pay off a thousand dollars in debt, or I'm going to get to go home to see my family this Christmas, or my daughter's going to get something that she really wanted that I just couldn't find money for. And I mean, that is really fun and cool. And I was still working at GameStop doing that. And it's like, what has Alex Jones done for any anybody? What has Trump done for anybody? I mean, you know, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I'm just saying with these very little resources, yeah. I can do a little something. I mean, what if you had $100 million in the bank? You wouldn't help anyone? 
a Habitat yeah. for Humanity house is like 20 grand just for the PR. Just make one and put mm-hmm. people in it. Like who, who gives a shit? The, there's, that's so much money. So it, it's just crazy. I, I don't know why people have any faith in that. I think we should just, you know, do what you can to make yourself comfortable and distance yourself from the machine because no one is coming to save us. And that's why the health shows are important because that's another area where you can actually be responsible and do something. We're not going to get them to stop spraying chemtrails, but maybe you can learn about something like iodine that maybe makes you less susceptible to the the dangers. I mean, the the future does look bleak. I mean, I'm sorry that kind of is an honest assessment because I just think these agendas are so far and we aren't doing anything collectively and the individual can only do so much. And I think you just got to take care of you, your, you and your own right now. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with just about everything you said. I do think that, you know, the, one of the main tricks is that, of, uh, that happens with, uh, one of the things that happens with people, especially in the early years of looking into conspiracy and, and alternative information, is they get so lost on the pro- big problems that are outside of themselves that they really can't do anything about that, you know, that it's, it creates this sort of negative self-defeating mindset and then as you sort of, but not, not, not everyone does this, but as you sort of develop some wisdom and discernment as you go through this, you start to focus on, the ins- on your inner self, on, on you know, making a change from inside. And I think that's, I agree with you. Like that's where actually the health stuff is stuff we can do about. For each one of these things that is being done to us, there are things we can do to counteract them. And yeah, it sucks that we live in a world where we have to do that, where we have to spend our hard work, hard earned money on, on some sort of thing that counteracts something bad that's being done to us. But that, that, that's actually something that you can do. Changing the way you eat, changing, you know, just the things about how you take care of your body and your own mind. Um, really, it, it does act, even change your perspective on all the outer things and makes them seem not so overwhelming and they seem more manageable than when you're just focusing on those, you know? Right. So true. Yeah. Um, I also, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, people sometimes do ask me, like, is it depressing to be looking at this stuff all day? And it's like, not really, because I'm already cynical enough and I expect it to be negative. But the value in conspiracy culture is seeing that it's a rigged game, that you can't do things the way they're telling you to do them. That's the value of it. Like, I am so thankful every day to have control of my life. I, you know, I do what I want when I want, as long as I get five shows done a month. And that is the value. I never would have done that without conspiracy culture, maybe without 9-11, because yeah. these things that were like, look, dude, you're going to have to figure it out because you're not going to be able to work for anybody. You know, you're not happy at this job, at this job, at this job. Oh, what's the similarity? You're stuck in some middle management bullshit position in some corporate store. Of course, you're not going to be happy. You're never going to get paid what you're worth. And it's very, very scary to do your own thing. You know, I had a big fear of failure for a long time, because if you don't actually do what you say you're going to do, you can't fail. You know, every, everybody in your inner circle would be like, oh man, you would do great if you just did that podcast you're always talking about. Yeah, that's fine. You keep thinking that because you don't want to actually do it because then your chips are on the table, but you have to, because the alternative is just economic slavery. Yeah, no, I agree. I was just talking about that with a friend the other day because I, you know, things for me have, uh, are going in some ways to a new level and I'm, so I'm having some fears and doubts and whatever. I never used to have those because I never used to do anything. You know? right. and, and, and so now the sign that you have those worries is proof that your life has, that what you're doing has meaning. You know what I mean? So yeah, you just keep, keep moving towards where you're trying to get to. And absolutely, I agree. Um, the other thing I want to ask you about is I sense that, like, I don't know too much about, like, your back, you know, sort of your background and your political beliefs before conspiratorial, your conspiratorial kind of life. But I sense that you, a little bit like me, maybe come from a more, slightly more left or le- left-leaning background or, you know, or have some, like, in terms of your values, some left-type values. And I find it frustrating that... Um, I mean, at this point, I'm completely out of the spectrum, but from where I come, I still have some, you know, um, emotional attachment to that. And I find it upsetting sometimes that there aren't more people in the certain in the alternative realm or the conspiracy realm, because they're kind of, you know, overlap, but separate that come from that perspective. I mean, I can think of 
two really good researchers that are were for, you know that I fans of that were firmly left that being Dave McGowan and John Potash but mm-hmm. most of the others come from a right leaning perspective and of course you know most of the alternative media or the truth media is rightish i mean you know i guess you could say that like Sibel Edmonds and Newsbud is a little more balanced and you know obviously someone like Cynthia McKinney um, but most of the quote unquote left leaning alternative media is really more of a like hybrid mainstream kind of thing. Like there's a few that I think are starting to um, maybe see some light, see something else. Some, I think Jimmy Dore might one day find his way into our circles. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or someone like Dave Rubin has kind of stepped out. And while he's still a little bit more mainstream, he's starting to take a look at some other things. What do you think about all that? Are you frustrated with that? Do you, did I read you right on that? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, my parents were pretty just cool about not shoving anything down my throat except sending me to Catholic school. So it's not like I was getting this double dose at home that a lot of my friends were. And for me, in the environment that I cut my teeth, being rebellious was being kind of left because I was in this uh, this Christian conservative climate. And so to be a liberal atheist as a freshman or a sophomore in this bubble was the most taboo thing you could do. And of course, that's when a lot of the programming came out about if you're an intelligent person, this is just the paradigm. This is the model for intelligence. You know, the Richard Dawkins stuff, uh, the, uh, yeah. the other guy who died who wrote, like, God is a lie. But, yeah. you know, all those prominent atheists. Stephen uh, Gold. Um, I think there's another one. Uh, he was Go, Christian, uh, yeah, okay. uh, Hutchinson. Christopher, yeah. Oh, yeah, Christopher, yeah, yeah, Christopher yeah. Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah those guys, there's, there's several of them. And they all came out with these books at the same time. And as a freshman, I just loved the provocativeness of just sitting in a classroom holding a book that says God is a lie. Like, yeah. you didn't have to do anything wrong to get sent to the principal's office, but hold a book. So it's like, uh, that's yeah really had an impact and you so, wonder why you got kicked out of catholic school <laughs> so wait so were you i think were you uh, like i i used to be an atheist i'm not an atheist anymore i'm more sort of agnostic or spiritual but are you were you you are at that point an atheist then you'd consider yourself an atheist yeah at that point i would and then it yeah. wasn't until uh i did and i was i mean conceptually i liked the idea of cryptids i liked the idea of aliens and all this other stuff but if you really tried to pin me down, I probably would have said, oh, I'm a material atheist. And I think this is all we have is, you know, you die, you die, which yep. is what you got. Me you know, too. That's, what, that's the model that I was really given. I didn't have a lot of other ones at the time that wasn't the Christian or, the, you know, the Catholic paradigm. So, I mean, I wanted to say that now I think the left has gone way too far and I've swung back quite a bit. You know, yep. you, people say things like nanny state uh, government when they're criticizing your position when you're a freshman back then and you're like I don't see that at all I see the left is the side where they're a little more loose with their talk you know it's the it's the right that's saying oh we need to censor speech and no bad words and uh, you know no marijuana like that was all the right back in the time I grew up and no more it is really I, now you really see oh I get what you meant by nanny state it's all this PC police bullshit like that is bothersome to me uh, and I also don't you know now it's like I don't even want that label near me because of what it represents yeah. now but yeah, no, no, I, I'm, I'm with you I'm on all but that if you look at the spectrum yeah. and it's shifted quite a bit in my lifetime which is a little bit longer than both of yours in the fact that if you go back now and look at history you would discover that John F Kennedy who was a Democrat and was probably considered liberal in the day, is a greater, was a greater conservative in his time than Ronald Reagan. Yeah. And, and then you look at Jimmy Carter, who was a liberal, and Carter seems conservative compared to, well, Obama, but, you know, we're, now, we're, now we're delving, in, we're dipping our toe into a different pond completely. The, right. the, 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 the spectrum of politics, I always define liberalism and define myself in terms of a social liberal in that I didn't believe in constraining individual rights. And then I delved into libertarianism 
And that ultimately wound up being a huge disappointment as well because yeah. they, they didn't have well, they still do not have a well defined platform. No, I agree. Um, I also feel like libertarians also so much of the, their focus is really on money. Economics, and, yeah. Vices, yes. Very yeah. cold as a philosopher. Very cool. Yeah. Th th I know. I, I mean, I, I was attracted to like when I, you know, figured out five minutes after the 2008 election that we had been tricked and fooled and that it wasn't just that we'd been tricked and fooled by Obama, but that the whole system was, you know, tricking, you know, tricking and fooling us. I leaned towards libertarianism for like, 30 or 40 minutes because I liked some of the things Ron Paul was saying, but I found that exactly what you said, like over there, it's like so much about just cold, harsh economics. There's no warmth. There's no sort of like humanity to it. And I very quickly moved into more like, I, you know, what I would call a holistic anarchist or a voluntarist stance, which is pretty much where I've been, you know, been since then. Um, and, you know, but yeah, like the focus on the focus on money of the right always disturbed me. But I agree with you. The left has become um, completely authoritarian. You know, I think it's now like rather than looking at things right or left, when you look at things as authoritarian or li or liberal libertarian, you know, I don't mean that in the political sense, but like either you believe in authority or you believe in liberty. And it seems like there are people on the right, like people who like Trump and people on the left who like this sort of regressive nanny state oppression Olympics PC kind of thing. They're all authoritarian. It doesn't really matter where on the spectrum they lie in terms of like their policies. It's all authoritarian. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just such a circus. And I, you know, it, you, I haven't thought about this in a long time, but I do remember when I was working at GameStop, having to rush home, going 90 miles an hour, trying to get home to interview this Judge Jim Gray, who was a Superior Court Justice in California, and he was the running mate for, um, oh, the libertarian guy, Gary Johnson, the first time that he mm -hmm. So I'm like, holy shit, you know, I got this little podcast that nobody at work knows about, and I'm interviewing you know, the libertarian vice presidential nominee. And I was so psyched about it. And I liked a lot of the direction it was going. But where it broke down was over the minimum wage. He's like, oh, we don't believe in a minimum wage. I'm like, well, you think corporations are going to are going to just pay us what we're worth? They already don't. So just the idea that I get it, you know, you don't want state control. But at the same time, you think corporations have your best interest at heart? They're monsters. They are psychopathic monsters. And the government is basically just another corporation. Well, the government is another yeah. corporation. It's the yeah. secret corporation. All the other yeah. corporations are licensed by and basically answer to the big corporation in Washington, D.C. That's all that is. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. my, my awakening came when I went to um, Virginia and looked at the charter documents that went back to well, 1671 and realized that this was never anything more than a venture for profit. This was a business deal from the beginning. I mean, the new colony was basically a franchise and that's all it's ever been. Right. Franchise is such a great term. Uh, yeah. I've had some guests go down the path of, you know, we all pay, property tax when you own a home and it never goes away. It's never paid off. It's like you're renting the land and who are you renting the land from, you know? And it's like, yeah. maybe it all goes back to triple crown control. You got those three areas of the globe that are structured the same. The city of London is inside London, yet it's, own, it's its own sovereign state. You got the Vatican with the same situation in Washington, DC. You got the spiritual authority, the governmental authority, and the military, it's yep. right there. I mean, I, I think that's a provocative case when people make the triple crown control one and the idea that we really are just, like you say, a franchise, great term, of that same empire. Yeah. Yeah. So the last thing I kind of wanted to hit on here as we're sort of wrapping up the first hour um, is one of the things Randy and I have also been sort of, we've talked about in the background, mentioned it a few times on the show, but we've been sort of, disturbed and confused at I don't, like you know obvious it's obvious that in a lot of ways the alt-right is a reaction to this sort of nanny state authoritarian left in some ways um you know it's sort of you know an, kind of like a you can't do all of this pc thing and then not expect it to sort of snap back on the other side but you know 
it had it, that was an interesting sort of break in the alternative media. I know for many many years, um, Red Ice Radio was a favorite of Randy and my, uh, Randy and mine. And I'm going to guess that maybe yours as well. Yeah. And uh, it was one of those things that when they first started going that path, you know, it was I paid attention. Like I, I you know, and I thought in the beginning there was some fair points, and then it just kind of devolved into something that, like, I mean mostly is sad to me. Do you have any comments on that? Or, you know, what were your kind of thoughts when you saw where that was going? I mean, it's been troubling to me how somebody who was so interested in so many different topics and really had the cream of the crop in terms of esoteric podcasts on the web could uh, wind it up in this spot where they're really only concerned about one thing and, and one thing only. And it's been troubling on a certain level. What do you think? I agree with you. I definitely liked Red Ice and that was definitely an inspiration being the American Red Ice because they had also changed as I was starting to make the show. And I was like, oh, wow. Like I was a little worried about like uh, kind of doing the same thing you're doing. But if you're going to go do this other thing, well, then great. Like, because I'm definitely not going to do that alt right thing. And it's just, you know, I've never met Henrik and he had the best conspiracy podcast yeah. for a long time and now it is just all right. I, I can't remember why I listened to it maybe six months ago, but in the intro, it doesn't even say that they're an alternative podcast anymore. The intro says all right podcast. Like yeah. why would you put yourself in a group like that? I just don't get it when you were on the outside for so long. Well, not only that, but he put himself on a spectrum. He put yeah. himself at the right end of a spectrum which means now he's pigeonholed. I, there's yeah. nowhere to go with this. Well, it's yeah. interesting to me how he ended, like, he ended up in this situation where like he, okay, so he completely must have forgotten all of the things he learned because he should be able to see that like this is a construct, like this whole situ situation is a construct, but he ended up in this situation where his entire website was taken down, was hacked, and taken down the same day as the Charlottesville riot. And he somehow, I mean, I've heard him mention a few things much, much later about how he maybe he should have been more suspicious, but he completely, it, it was so wrapped up in um, the alt-rightedness or whatever, the racial and the, or the, what, I don't even know what the right term is to use, aspect of this whole thing that he completely missed that like, if he had his conspiracy hat on, he would know that a reason to distract him and take his own website down was so that he wouldn't be paying attention to what was actually going on on the ground there because his conspiratorial mind, if he could still tap into it, would see that something was wrong. Yeah, definitely could be. I mean, I'm pretty much willing to explore any topic, any rabbit hole, and I really cannot be offended being someone who likes comedy and conspiracy material. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, maybe I won't talk about some of those really hairy things where it gets into, uh, you know, the white genocide and all that stuff that they basically obsess over. I, you know, I sometimes I, I, I get into that stuff. And I'm just like, wow, like this is such a, a, a weird thing to be thinking, because don't you think comparatively, like we're pretty much doing better than like every other group, like probably on the planet and your focus is on a white genocide it seems a little uh insensitive it just seems a little pompous i get it that you got to be concerned about your own but it's like i think the attack is on all of us and i well, isn't our own look you know i looked at this whole thing with specifically henrik but even more in wide scope the responses of people in general to something like black lives matters which is a completely scripted movement that was funded to create blowback in the first place yeah. and then tie it to the alt-right movement, which tangentially connects back to Trump, which means that we now have a white racist government with an orange haired madman <laughs> in the White House. And for somebody like Henrik or somebody like myself, you're, uh, anybody here on, 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 on this show, our buttons aren't pushed like that because I'm not looking at I, I'm as angry as anybody about the flood that occurred in Europe as a result of basically driving people like animals across borders to escape what was essentially staged military operations by U.S. intelligence services. 
Of course I'm pissed off about that. No. The, the, and, the, and the blowback against Islam, the same thing. You know, we create an enemy, we, we elevate that to bogeyman status, then we create counter enemies as an insurgency to then push people in a certain direction. And in, in, in the course of all of this, I'm thinking, if you've been in this realm long enough, if you're capable of following the trajectory of the original idea and how it moves people on the continuum, you're not going to respond like that. Your response is going to be a little bit more philosophical and seasoned in a position that says, I am not my skin color. I'm not even my sexuality. I'm not anything that comprises my physicality. I'm a spirit living in a world. And therefore, I'm not going to respond to this in the predictable manner, which is exactly what anybody who's studying conspiracy needs to do. We need to learn how to zig to the zag and not be orchestrated like a pack of ants. Cheers to that. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. I mean, I, you know. Primary then, you know, race is secondary. I mean, if, if we're all consciousness absolutely. at our core, then that's kind of what you should focus on. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, when he first started going that path, I listened to some of those early shows. And to be fair, there were some, yes. there was some fair points, you know what I mean? Like in the, before it devolved too far. And I feel like, um, those fair points he had would have had stronger effect had he really focused in on some of those instead of letting it devolve into, into, you know, into what, into what it has. But, but even within that, you know, I appreciate the work he did prior and we're all on our own spiritual journeys here. And I, and I hope at some point his will, uh, you know, bring him back, um, bring him back to, you know, being so, so, to part of us again, because I think he made such a valuable contribution for so long. And, you know, I, it's, you know, he was doing, he was doing it long before any of us were, and it can't always be an easy road to sort of walk. And sometimes you get fatigued with some of this stuff or, you know, also, you know, you never know what kind of, you know, how he may have been, you know, targeted by some things and some people, you know, I noticed what I, I noticed a funny thing happen after that, um, 2014 secret space program in Northern California. It was the second one. There had been one in 2012 in Europe, but he, which he hosted as well. He hosted the one here in 2014. And then right after that secret space program, we, I mean, we got, we started getting this alt-right stuff. We started getting the flat earth stuff. We started getting the blue chicken cult version of the secret space program. So it felt to me like something was going on in that period of time that was becoming powerful and was becoming too close to breaking through to something. And they had to sort of, do you know something happened that sort of shattered or you know fragmented that and we got all of this weird stuff this weird distraction um really right after that i mean i agree that the goal of a new world order is you know a globalized homogenized single culture i think they try to give us a new yeah. culture to kind of onboard us to that type of way but mm -hmm. i think he interprets like for example, something like the immigrant crisis in Europe. I mean, I, I was in London uh, two years ago and like I saw it, I was like, oh my God, like now that I'm walking through like blocks and blocks and blocks that look nothing like what I would think London looks like, um, maybe he's got a little bit of a point here. I'd never yeah. been there. And so, I mean, that was a little jarring, but I think he interprets that as an attack on European culture, the whole influx. And I think of it more as an attack on their system as being the last one on the planet where their citizens still have some autonomy and actually get some benefit out of the taxes they pay. I think if you were a global elite looking around for where you could penny pinch, you know, where you could suck out some wealth, you would be like, hey, let's get all these people to come over to Europe so that, and then let's propagandize them so that they look at these people as the ones who are sucking the system down. You know, they're Europe's Mexicans now. And from that position, people be like, yeah, you know what? I am better off on my own. Fuck these taxes. Like, let's get rid of all the benefits we have in this society. And they're going to take Europe and make it like more like a right wing United States perspective. I mean, that's just my opinion, but I see it as from the elite, they're going to be looking at money and where they can you know, extract a little more. And I think that's how you do it. I don't think it's exactly an attack on the white race to bring in people of another culture. I, I think it's more of an attack on the financials of that system. But 
you know, what do I know? I'm a college dropout stoner from Southern California. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> very, very interesting. I some good points there, Greg. All right. So we're kind of getting to the end of the first hour here. Before we close the first hour out, Greg, tell people where they can find your show, your shirts, all your stuff. What's going on on the higher side? Yes. Appreciate it. I, I rarely even bring up the shirts, but yes, uh, the show is called The Higher Side Chats. You can find it at thehiresidechats.com. I do that same classic model where the first hour is free, the second hour is five bucks. You know, that allows it to be commercial free, interruption free, and, uh, you know, it's working out all right. So if you like the first hour, of course, you can sign up at the thehiresidechatsplus.com. And I also have always liked alternative t-shirts. Maybe that's something that comes from being a young punk and being obsessed with all these bands and having to have a t-shirt. So I made a t-shirt company that is based off the designs from the show. And I got again, lucky with some amazing, amazing artists, two in particular, and they crafted some designs that have a level of depth and detail that I just would not have been able to, to give to them on paper because they're familiar with the material. So, you know, there are some, some shirts that just completely resonate with certain episodes that I think are, are really, <laughs> like completely unique. And so that's pretty cool. We talked a little bit about money magic. You know, I did a show with Tracy Twyman where she's done all this research about Baphomet and the Knights Templar and that, you know, through their worship and connection to this entity Baphomet, they were willing to basically be the first bankers or the first people who had like a checking system when they would do their chit and like people would travel and they'd make a glyph that would rec that would be like their ledger. And then only internally would they know that glyph. So it was like early banking to a degree. And they built wealth by basically, you know, probably over leveraging those notes in a fractional reserve type of way. And that's money magic. And it came from this entity, Baphomet. So that's a lot of context to say there is like one design where it's Baphomet with the Knights Templar bowing down to them inside that oval that frames the faces on dollar bills. So like that kind of stuff is just, I love it. And yeah. it's, pretty unique and again i'm not the artist so i feel like i can brag about it because you know it's not really my work yeah well we're, we're, to a degree but the higher side clothing.com is where that is we're certainly at big tracy twyman appreciators here and her work is definitely deserving of its own uh, nod on a t-shirt i agree so that's absolutely awesome all right so uh guys stick with us into the second hour go over to patreon.com to join us we are going to uh to cover the topic of the shape of the <laughs> the shape of the earth, and what might or might not be inside. We'll oh, see no. on the other. We'll see on the other side. All right, guys. Thank you. Don't, 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 don't,